It's no accident that the New Mexico in Focus line today is made up of accomplished panelists who all happen to be women. As we know, despite years of activism and accomplishment, we're far from the goal of gender equality. So to lead a discussion on women in the 2014 election, we're pleased to welcome back to the program Martha Burke. Martha is a political psychologist, women issues expert, and author of Your Voice, Your Vote, a savvy woman's guide to power, politics, and the change we need. Her credits include co-founder of the Center for Advancement of Public Policy, money editor for Ms. Magazine, syndicated newspaper columnist, frequent blogger for the Huffington Post, and host of Public Radio's Equal Time with Martha Burke. Most people don't realize it, but women can control any election. That's because women are the majority of the population, the majority of registered voters, and the majority of those that actually show up at the polls. This year's election is particularly crucial for women, with economic issues and health care at the top of the list. Pay equity is still number one with women. And here in New Mexico, we have the second highest poverty rate in the nation. One reason for women's high poverty rate is our low minimum wage, because adult women are another majority, the majority of minimum wage workers. Our second concern is health care. Obamacare is under attack by a lot of candidates that want to repeal it. But it has provisions on birth control, mammograms, and premiums that are going to affect women if the law is overturned. Let's start with the minimum wage. Carla, is it time for a raise? I don't personally believe that government should be setting wages. I have been involved in that fight, and I think the answer is that women need to know their value and go where they're going to be paid that value. And I don't think the government needs to intervene in that. So that's my thought on it, that women can do better, and they just need to realize that and go do it. Well, Pat Buchanan said that same thing to me one time, and I said, let's just go back to slavery because the uh, businesses can make a lot of money that way. Stephanie, what's your take on it? Yeah, so it's not going to come as a shock to my fellow panelists, but I completely disagree with the lovely Carla Sontag. I believe that hard work does deserve fair pay, and if it is... Um, necessary for us to either do it through a constitutional amendment and take it to the voters and therefore not have government necessarily imposing it, that's one option, or change it statutorily at the state level or at the federal level, but I think it is time. The New Mexico um, uh, minimum wage has been the same for the last seven years and it's time. We are uh, in need of a raise, Martha. Well, New Mexico's minimum wa wage right now, if we look at all of our border states, uh, we're next to lowest. Texas is a little bit lower. If the raise that was contemplated in the last legislature had passed, mm -hmm. we'd still be in the same place as far as the hierarchy is concerned. Now, our job creation is the worst in the nation, not just the worst in our region. Laura, what do you make of that? They say, well, if you raise a minimum wage, you're going to lose jobs. We don't have any jobs now. Well, that's definitely a, a common criticism, and I, I frankly see it as a scare tactic. I mean, uh, you know, to the issue of whether government should be involved in this, if, if government weren't involved in um, workplace equity, we would still have, um, you know, factories without any standards. We would have people who would be working without any kind of um, breaks, without any kind of lunch hours. There wouldn't be, there would be children working. I mean, government has been involved in all of these stages, and I think this is a, a very appropriate place to be involved. And had the, uh, the last uh, wage increase remained, kept, been kept up in terms of inflation, we'd be up to about $10 an hour now, a little bit over. So um, it, it doesn't make sense that we've basically not been able to bring it up, and I think it is time. I agree with Stephanie on that. Um, you know, there's some concern, especially around um, a lot of small businesses like restaurants that pay, um, that have servers, having to raise that amount, and I think that was an issue that happened here recently with um, one of the restaurants locally having that concern. But I think that ultimately, um, when you have pe when you pay people a better wage, they have more disposable income, and we are a consumer industry. We're a consumer economy. So um, when people actually spend their money, it creates more um, economic development, more economy in general, and you end up growing business. So those same businesses that are complaining that they would end up having to cut, cut workers, they would also end up with people um, who are consumers who would be spending more in their establishments. And I think that's an important outcome for our economy. That's a very good point. We had 13 states that raise a minimum wage last year in the United States, last year and this year, and all 13 of them, employment went up. 
So we did not lose any jobs, but merit, many people say, okay, if we raise the minimum wage, we're gonna lose companies. They're gonna move across the border to lower wage states, you're in business. If we raise the minimum wage by even a dollar an hour, would you move to Texas? Well, I think the issue is uh, more on businesses have a budget and they're planning. And I think for an individual state, or worse, an individual municipality to raise the minimum wage ahead of the state or ahead of the federal government is disaster uh, for that community. Because the, again, these businesses have a budget. So if suddenly you make ha offering jobs more expensive, you are either gonna have fewer jobs or your employees who are not making minimum wage are going to get fewer raises. Um, also price, prices will go up. And so will you really get the purchasing power you expected? So. I don't think it's going to uh, force companies to leave. I don't, th I don't think it would help a stagnating economy where job creation is a problem. We're making it more expensive to create jobs. Martha, could I to that point on the Absolutely. municipal piece? Um, actually, so just to push back just a little bit, Merritt, um, when it comes to local uh, raise increases. Santa Fe passed a living wage, as you guys know, several years ago. And the city of Santa Fe is actually doing better in terms of economic development than any city, any county in the state of New Mexico. So I think that's kind of an argument against what, what your point was, Merritt. But I, I guess I do see, you know, the point around larger corporations moving into a state and having to navigate different levels of minimum wages throughout the different municipalities. But well, I mean, Santa Fe is a great example of how it's working. But I, I, what I've seen in Albuquerque is uh, examples where employees who are making less than $10 an hour, but not minimum wage, have actually seen pay cuts as employers have to take the same pool of dollars and make these changes. You know, this so is an interesting, uh, an interesting point you're making. Employers don't have to take the same pool of dollars. They have several options, particularly the larger ones. Uh, you can take it out of, let's take Darden, inter, uh, Darden restaurants. They're the largest uh, food service employer in the United States. They made $282 million in profits last year. We always talk about, well, it's gotta come out of the other employees or it's gotta be passed along to the customer. What about those multi-million dollar bonuses or those uh, stock dividends? You know, we could put some of this on the 99% instead of that 1%, which again is mostly women that's working down there in the minimum wage. And just for a last word here, Carla, in terms of women's poverty in this state, because it is mostly adult women working for that low wage. If they made more money, wouldn't they spend more money and boost business? Well, absolutely, they wouldn't have a choice because prices will go up on every service and commodity that they use. We've talked to people that have seen a wage increase like that, and they say they are actually bringing home less than they had before. The other thing to keep in mind with corporations, you raise the minimum wage, and if they have a lot of people at that wage, then you have the next level of employment, those people that have worked and earned more than minimum wage, well, if minimum wage comes up to where they are, then they need to have a raise. And so it's incremental all the way up. It doesn't affect just that bottom layer, and that's what can impact jobs. But my concern primarily is, what are these women and families going to be bringing home when it's done? And speaking to Santa Fe, I think we need to look when they raise that wage, how many of our young people dropped out of school because they thought that was the golden rainbow they could go after and make a higher wage than stay in school and look at something else later. And well, I think that, we've got to look at all the effects. That's a fault in the education system if that's what they thought. But I think what you just said is the rising tide lifts all boats. We're going to need to move to health care now. As I said in the intro, we have a lot of candidates that still want to overturn Obamacare. Obamacare has some differential effects on women, uh, particularly with preventive care. Uh, we now have birth control for the most part without co-pays as Viagra has been, I might add, for many years. Uh, we have mammograms as a preventive thing that we don't have to pay co-pays for, and they cannot gender rate the policies. If it's overturned, women are going to lose all that. Laura, is that a good thing? Is that fair? 
Um, well, I think it's a good thing that, that we have those provisions um, in the Affordable Care Act, uh, and that's something that I think is going to help a lot of women across the board, folks that really have not been able to um, use whatever additional discretionary income from their low-paying jobs um, to, to spend it on things that were um, previously unfunded, so things that were not covered. Um, screenings are really important, and, uh, and, and certainly the birth control factor um, is huge, and it's clearly um, unfair, in my opinion, and I think most a lot of people would agree that um, you know to fund something like Viagra but not fund birth, basic birth control is um, is really a disparate impact on women. So I think overturning that is uh, an example of the war on women that we've seen. So those candidates that are wanting to overturn that, uh, wanting to overturn Obamacare, um, and uh, you know with the impact, with the effect of um, not funding those kinds of preventive services, it's really just a war on women. Merit, before uh, Obamacare was passed, insurance companies could and did charge women more for the same coverage that men were getting and paying less. And it didn't have anything to do with maternity coverage. That's taking maternity co coverage out of the equation. If Obamacare is overturned, that'll be legal again. Uh, what would you do about a practice like that? Well, I find that very upsetting. I've been providing excellent health care for my employees since I started my own business for nine years, and I think that's, I think that's very important. There's also a copay for them and their families, but my broker tells me uh, every year that I'm offering too rich a plan. I, I disagree. Now, the problem I see with Obamacare is these points we're making about um, equity of care. That is all very important. The issue is, and we've seen this in the New Mexico statistics, New Mexico women are not, are not signing up they still feel it's too expensive. And the idea that there'll be a tax penalty that would spur them is actually incorrect because a bronze plan that's ACA approved um, is based on nine and a half percent of total income. The tax penalty kicks in if you um, decline a plan because it's more than eight percent of your income. So automatically by refusing the the uh, bronze plan, these uh, women are avoiding the tax penalty and they're going to continue Go stumbling along without resources. You're telling us it's complicated and I think we do know that a lot of women don't know that they are eligible for some of the subsidies. We have less than a minute. I'm going to give Stephanie and Carla 15 seconds each. Last word. Great. Now I think this really speaks to the need of investing in the infrastructure to communicate to those women that are eligible for it the way that they can sign up and I do think to your point about the differential benefits and whether or not overturning takes us back Absolutely it does. I think it's 2014, it's high time that being a woman is not classified as a pre-existing condition. Carla, do you agree with that? I do, and I, you know, I will say, I don't think this is gonna be overturned, but I think it needs a lot of work. And one of the things that I need to say, I don't believe in this war on women. I don't want to ever foresee or say that I am a victim. I think that we've got to look at everything objectively. I agree that women should be treated equally under the plan and should be able to get things that they need. That's the last word. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful panel, all women. Thanks, Martha. For more news of the week, head to our website at NewMexicoInFocus.org to catch the line panelists as they go on the clock. As always, all of us here at New Mexico in Focus appreciate your time and your effort to stay informed and engaged. Catch up with us anytime on Facebook and Twitter by searching New Mexico in Focus. And you can find archived interviews and often bonus material, including those on the clocks, on our YouTube channel and again at NewMexicoInFocus.org. I'm Gene Grant. We'll see you next week in Focus.